My name is Michelle Benton, and I recently started Maven for Legalization. I am new to the cannabis movement because I have a terminal immune disorder. That disorder is called CVID, and that means Common Variable Immune Disorder. My specific ailment is hypogonadinemia, which is the IgG of your system that causes the normal body to produce antibodies to protect yourself from uh, bacterial infections, viruses, etc. Every 21 days, I go to the Kirkland Cancer Center at UAB to be infused with gamma globulin infusions, and my infusion drug is Privagen. So believe me, it is an uncomfortable way to live, and I will have to continue infusions for the rest of my life in order to stay alive. How I got to this point was trying to find alternatives to pharmaceutical medications and coming from a very long line of medical professionals. Uh, my father is a retired orthopedic surgeon. My uncle is the chief of neurosurgery here in Montgomery. I am a former medical professional in highlighting in internal medicine, but I've also done home health care, medical auditing. I had a crash course in RNICU with my identical twin daughters, uh, born at 24 weeks, and again in Children's Hospital when my surviving twin daughter was admitted for sepsis in 2011 in December and was released February of 2011. 10 to 2011 as admitted in 2012 was discharged. Thankfully, she does not have any physical disabilities, but she does have a quite a number of mental uh, disabilities, uh, short-term memory problems, um, and my son, youngest son, also is ADD, ADHD. He has broad spectrum autism and Asperger's syndrome, and I have been following research regarding using cannabis for these particular uh, disorders. Uh, I'm not at the point right now where I would consider giving these to my children until further research is presented to me, being that I'm a medical professional and uh, my job is to research. So I am here today because I am out of options. I am one of the patients that is out of time. Uh, my disease is progressive. It is unlike cancer. There is no cure. Uh, there is no remission for me. So my disease pro uh, progression is daily. Right now, I'm in the middle of a flare, so forgive me if I stumble over my words, which I typically do not do, and heat greatly affects me. So I'm not quite spot on today, but um, I have a team of medical professionals that follows me probably 10 to 16, uh, and I actually go to my infusion tomorrow to be infused, and I am being investigated because I now have abnormal high liver functions, and my thyroid is beginning to deteriorate, so the disease process is indeed progressing. I was introduced to medical cannabis when I went to Colorado a couple of years ago when they held the cannabis cup and was blown away by the array of substances that they had in different forms, from oil to hash to keef to flour uh, uh, to shatter, wax, rosin. Uh, and from being from Alabama and being a product growing up in the 1980s and 1990s, those of you who may remember the Just Say No campaign, Dare for Drugs, uh, that still rings resoundingly in my ears. So I went forward very tentatively in order to do self-research on myself, but I had also been studying studies from Israel and other countries because unfortunately in the United States, we are just now beginning to start studying the cannabis and how it works and how it treats and how it heals many different disorders, diseases, uh, and, just, uh, and uh, depression. I can go on with that. You all probably realize if you if are educated as I am about what cannabis does for each of you, as well as our veterans, as well as people with cancer. 
So I was delayed in getting here this morning because a friend of mine passed away this morning from brain cancer. Uh, so he was diagnosed six weeks ago and he died this morning. Uh, and he was uh, perfectly fine until he had a problem with his leg. He went in and had a CAT scan of his head and six weeks later this morning he passed away. So it's that fast. But my primary purpose for being here is to advocate and educate people about the true medical benefits of cannabis. Uh, I believe that our legislatures need to know that a new face for this needs to be medical cannabis and our doctors need to realize that this is a viable treatment for many different disorders, many ailments. Some already do, but they are reluctant to come forward, mainly because, unfortunately, there is a stigma in the South, as we all know, against it. Uh, and they are afraid that if they do come forward, they may potentially lose their practice. And that, uh, that is something that I would not want to happen to them coming from this background. And uh, I can tell you where I started with this, being a product of an orthopedic surgeon daughter. Um, as time has gone by, physicians have been dictated by insurance companies what they can and cannot prescribe, what tests they can and cannot run, what they approve and will not approve, uh, and patients end up getting the treatment that they do not need. The, phar the pharmaceutical companies also have a big hand in this and that I know for certain, having a background in pharmacology as well, that a lot of the drugs that are out there today that have lost their patents have been put back on the market and are used for different reasons. Well, Butrin is a very old drug, for one, that is now called Chantix for smoking. There is no difference in that. There's no difference in the molecular makeup. The company just changed the name and there you have a new patent, and I believe that the restriction on that is still seven years. Unless that's changed, I'm not for certain. So that, in reality, is what's going on. You have an old drug that maybe would cost you less than $20. Now it'll cost you $150 plus. So the medications that I receive, my infusions alone are in excess of 20, uh, probably $16,000 each infusion every 21 days. Now, I realize that not having an immune system, cannabis is not going to be able to save my life that way. However, it does and it has helped when I was able to obtain it and I was able to use and experiment and find what worked for me in Colorado uh, and it worked well. My depression deteriorated and it was resolved. My body was instantly relaxed. My muscle spasms, which I have muscle wasting disease, subsided. My pulmonary functions, most notably, and can be seen on paper. Uh, I am not a hot smoke person. Uh, I've never recreationally used cannabis. So my first attempt at using cannabis was at 44 years old. I'm 46 now. So this is a new frontier for me and a new frontier going forward for those like me and those that are younger than me and also for you. So having said that, the, the problem that we are experiencing now is physicians can no longer practice medicine the way they need to practice medicine because they are dictated by insurance companies and the insurance companies are dictated by the pharmaceutical companies. How we get past that I'm not sure, but we need to, in order to have appropriate medicine for what I know works and what you know works. It's a plant. It is not a drug. It is not addictive. It does not kill you. It is not, you cannot overdose from it. You cannot die from it. Uh, and I had nothing but positive results. So 
being that I was never a recreational user, I cannot relate to the terms being stoned or getting high uh, because I simply uh, do not know what that experience is. But what I can tell you is, is that although I have to use extreme, pretty extremely high amounts, and CBD oil does not work for my disorders, I have to use very high quantities of THC, very high percentages. And I've been lucky enough to, when I was in Colorado a couple of years ago, find some that were over 90%. So um, my preferences and what works best for me are the THC, Fush, and OG strains. That combats depression, that combats uh, anxiety, it combats muscle wasting disease. It is used for MS, which many of my symptoms mimic MS. And I am at risk of developing MS because when you have CBID, as your disease progression continues, I am at a 75% greater chance of developing some sort of lymphoma or lymphatic cancer. So I am constantly being watched for that. And in, by saying that, if we already have any cannabinoid system in our body, which every mammalian brain does have, humans, animals, we all have it. However, the vast majority of the public and obviously our legislature do not know that this exists. There are studies that are readily available to anyone who wants to go and study this. Now, I could break it down for you as a medical professional about the receptor cells and the C1s and the C2s and whatever, but that's really way above the, the basic reason of why I'm here. But that is what I am studying, and I'm studying it because it works for me. Uh, if I was able to pick up and leave and go to a legal state, I would because I want to live as long as I can with a good quality of life. But since I have not been able to procure what I need, it's been since November of 2015, where I was lucky enough to go to the High Times Jamaican Cup in November uh, 2015. Uh, quite frankly, I was not impressed with the event at all. I don't believe that it went well, and the Jamaican people were grossly misled by the event coordinator. And I took a walk on the beach one day out of anger and met an island native who happened to notice my distress and came over to me and began speaking to me. And we ended up talking until the wee hours of the morning about different strains of ganja, as they call it in Jamaica. And the next day, he surprised me by taking me to a place called Mayfield Falls. And Mayfield Falls has a spring that is inside a cave system where I met a Rastafari holy man who I jumped into the spring and it is ice cold and was blessed by this Rasta holy man in, in the springs. And from there, I was taken to Mr. Lyndon Connell's house. For those of you who do not know about the Jamaican struggle, Mr. Lyndon Connell was one of the freedom fighters for Jamaica and is one of the foremost prominent gentlemen who fought for years to have decriminalization of cannabis in Jamaica. That happened in 2015. Little did I know that my friend Elvis would take me to Mr. Connell's house where I spent the evening with him, his family, his children, and his grandchildren and I was able to sample Jamaica's finest organic, naturally grown, outdoors ganja. It was one of the most amazing experiences I've had in my life. If I could move to Jamaica, I would. Jamaica has a stigma that is a dangerous place. Uh, perhaps, yes, in the old days it was. Jamaica has really turned things around and they are trying their best to educate people about their strains of ganja. And uh, unfortunately, the vast majority of Jamaicans were not able 
at the High Times Cup to have a booth because they were too expensive to promote their medicine, as they call it. I was fortunate enough to be able to sample some of Mr. Connell's good medicine, as he called it, which apparently, I've been told, is the best ganja in Jamaica. And it was. So, it was an immediate relief. Uh, it was in flower form. The uh, amazing part of it, if any of you have seen the article that Leslie Kahn wrote, it has a picture of me and my tour guide, Elvis, uh, who took me to Mr. Connell's house. And I'm pictured with one of the handmade carved bongs, if you will, which is not what they call it, but it is made out of a carved coconut shell. And it has a stick extending from it that is hollow, made out of Jamaican indigenous wood. And in the top is affixed a hand molded brass cup in which they put a full flower on the top and they heat it until it is roughly red hot and that's how that comes. So there's probably about an inch between the cup at the top extending down into the coconut shell. I wanted to take one home as an art piece, uh, but unfortunately could not do that because of what it was. But I hope that I will be able to return to Jamaica and get that. So I made a promise to the Jamaicans that day, especially the Rastafari, that I would do what I could to get their message out. And I'm here to do that today for Mr. Connell and thank him and let him know. And I'm sure he's already been told by my Jamaican friends that I am honored to have met him and honored to have been invited into his home to experience a different world of cannabis completely. And it is not stigmatized and viewed as it is here in the States, nor is it stigmatized and viewed in most other countries that have already decriminalized or legalized it. We are last. We are one of the last people, not just Alabama, but as the United States. And that, if we are supposed to be models for other countries, we are falling behind. And I do not have a political agenda. I'm not here for political purposes. I am here because I have a terminal disease. I am running out of time. I want to have a good quality of life as long as I can have a quality of life until I can no longer function. And I am deteriorating every day. But I try to have more good days than bad. But most of my days, unfortunately, are spent in a great deal of pain. Uh, from the beginning, I told my team of specialists that I absolutely refuse to use opiates and steroids because of the damage that they cause to your organs. I had HELP syndrome in which I went into complete renal and kidney failure uh, and luckily survived and was resuscitated and brought back after the birth of my daughters. So CVID, although it is a genetic disease located on chromosome number six, as well as the majority of your autoimmune disorders, um, I also am a bit of a medical enigma in that there is a theory that CVID can also stem from a trauma to kidneys or liver, but that is not able to be proven just yet. So, and unfortunately, HELP syndrome, uh, the, only uh, the only cure is delivery, and it is only occurring in 1% of the pregnant population. So I am very lucky to be alive. So with my first son, I hemorrhaged and almost died in 1998, 1997 is when he was born. Uh, in 2002, when my girls were born at 24 weeks gestation, I did die. Uh, I had an emergency C-section and delivered them and unfortunately one of my identical twin girls died at two weeks and two, uh, two months and two days. Um, she, she died because of an error during heart surgery and repair of a PDA valve. Um, so I do have PTSD and I have found 
that cannabis treats that. When I was able to use it, I was not unhappy. I was not depressed. I was able to get up out of bed every day. I had a renewed outlook on life. I was a better mother. I was able to get around free of pain. And since I have been unable to use since November of, 19, uh, of 2015, my health has been in a nosedive. I have lost uh, 20 pounds for unknown reasons. Uh, I am still being tested for cancer. They have not found it yet, but they suspect that I may be in the early development of getting cancer. Because we already know that, can that cannabis treats, heals, and places people in remission, my argument to those who were denying the legislation and the passage of this law to make cannabis legal for medicinal purposes, they are essentially signing my death warrant because I cannot use it. Unfortunately, I am not financially able anymore, nor am I healthy enough to travel to go to Colorado or any other legal state to obtain the medication that I believe will keep me alive. So I hope that my story, which I intend to write a letter, and you know, I've, I'm very well versed in writing letters for different causes. Uh, I will start a letter campaign writing to our senators in hopes that sharing my story will allow them to realize that the longer we go without the legalization, decriminalization, as the Jamaicans call it, they are continuing to sign death warrants, which to me is the exact same thing as the death penalty. We do not deserve to be penalized for using something that saves our lives. And there are many people that use it to save their lives and to be able to function pain-free every day. Uh, I was not a hot smoker. I used vapor. And my method was called a PAX. Uh, unfortunately, again, because I've not been able to obtain any products since 2015, my vaporizer has been put away, and I have not laid eyes on it since the end of November. Um, I can tell you that cannabis is not addictive because if it was, don't you think that I would be having withdrawal symptoms and trying to find it wherever possible? Addicts do that. Cannabis does not do that. Uh, when I did have it, I did not use it every day. I used it when I felt it was necessary. So if cannabis, as they say, is addicting, I think I would probably be sitting on the couch doing it all day long. However, I do not, and now I cannot. So I appeal to the human compassion of our legislators that they, they, they it, yeah, that everyone has to have some human decency and I believe if it is presented in the correct light and in a medical light, hopefully it will sway them in determining that cannabis is a viable and needed substance. It is not a medic, you know, it's a medicine, but it's a plant. Uh, the problem is, is that our FDA and our DEA are now threatened because they cannot control cannabis. Uh, they obviously are still trying, you know, we have problems in Washington, we have problems in Colorado, we have problems in San Francisco of them trying to tweak the laws now. That is a total injustice to every patient who fought so, and every advocate who fought so hard to get the medicine that they need in order to survive. So again, coming from a medical background, I am not uh, at liberty to say that it is the physician's fault because I come from a very long line of medical professionals. I have seen medical practices decimated because of these stringent restrictions placed upon them by insurance companies. And the insurance companies refuse to pay physicians and their practices 
the money that they need in order to remain in practice. So although on the surface we believe that physicians are unwilling to, to uh, consider cannabis, that part, especially in the South, is a stigma as well. And physicians are reluctant to even speak about it for fear they may lose their practice. And that is a very, very real thing. But over the course of the years, being, uh, ha having worked in the medical field since I was 15 years old, I have seen the complete disintegration, decimation of physician practices once 20 strong, once two or three practice, having to return to the hospital setting in order to stay in practice. So physicians are no longer the people that are the rich men. The ones that are still doing it today are the ones that truly have compassion and care about their patients, and it is not about the money. So insurance companies are the ones that are controlling our physicians and what they can and cannot do, what you can and cannot take, the test you can and cannot have, even though you may be tested for what is considered a terminal disease. So your waiting period is further denied and your disease progresses while your insurance company makes the decision to allow you to have a test. And the pharmaceutical companies also, although they relish attention on physicians, they come in with breakfast, lunch, snacks, trips, that's good, that's great, that's incentive in order for them to prescribe the medicine that they are there to have them write prescriptions for. Um, I have noticed a trend in physicians not allowing the, uh, the drug representatives to come in their offices and speak with them about prescribing a particular medicine. I think that is a step in the right direction and a good choice for the physicians to make. So as long as they continue to do that and realize that there's not a breakfast, lunch, snack, or trip that will make them prescribe the medication that they are presenting under a different name, uh, you know, just like the EpiPen incidents here that we're all aware of, there is an alternative but no one knew that. I made sure that I found the alternative because my daughter uses an EpiPen. And from, it was $20 two years ago. It's now, I understand, $600 plus. Dollars. So there is an alternative for those of you that need it. There is a generic, and you have to have your physician write product selection allowed, or you will get the brand name because they want your money. There's also ampules that you can get, but you have to be educated on how to use an ampule to break a piece of their glass and syringes to draw up the epinephrine. So this is just another example of our pharmaceutical companies trying to take over and run our health care. You, me, our children, uh, which is, which is completely wrong. So I am here today to make my statement because I am suffering from a terminal illness. I've got two children that need me that have special needs and they need me to be at my best and stay healthy and I would love to say that I will still be around to see them grow up to turn into hopefully happy, healthy, productive individuals, but at this point in time, I am not guaranteed that. So the way I live my life every day is to hope to get up and to do the best I can and continue to move forward until cannabis is legalized. Uh, cannabis has been stig uh, you know, under a stigma for so long, it is completely misunderstood and it's past time that I believe those in office should at least be educated or directed to take a class in order to educate themselves on what the e-cannabinoid system is and what it actually does. 
I believe that is the only way that we will get past the stigma because they do not understand what we are advocating for. In order to make an informed decision, you have to do your research and you have to be educated by it. So that being said, physicians have to take continuing educational courses. If our legislature is going to make these decisions for us, how many have MD behind their name? They are making decisions for each of us and they are signing our death warrants in many cases. They're practicing medicine without a license. Practi yeah, practicing medicine without a license. There are some physicians who do support, but they are very reluctant to come forward. I have talked to many of them. They are for it, but for fear of losing their practice, which means it will harm their families, anything could happen, and I truly feel for them because they are people just like you and I, and they are compassionate, and they do understand. And some of them do know about the e-cannabinoid system and the way it works. And I have done uh, extensive research on the study. I can tell you if you want to find some very detailed information, Wikipedia is the first one that you can go in and get an extreme detailed amount of information about the breakdown of the receptor cells and how they work and what they control. And it specifically says that being naturally occurring in our body, it controls your psychological well-being, controls your appetite, it controls muscles, it controls your brain, it controls almost and contributes to every function your body has. Not knowing that we have an e-cannabinoid system is a downfall because I fully believe that if people were laboratory tested to determine what their e-cannabinoid system looked like, like I was tested for CVID, having subclass testing for IgG, IgA, IgE, and IgM, the same can be said for the e-cannabinoid system you can test for specific receptor cells. So there is no excuse as to why that cannot be performed. It should be performed because I believe the overwhelming evidence will show that if the cannabinoid system is studied, that they will be shocked at what they discover and that they are truly missing just like I am termed a zebra, my disease is rare. So if they discover the information regarding the cannabinoid system, that cannot be denied because it is naturally occurring. So if it is shown that there is a deficiency in that, then it should be treated with cannabis. So that's why I'm here today, because I hope to live and my only choice is to appeal to our senators and those that we have elected in office to please educate themselves regarding the naturally occurring e-cannabinoid system because I want to live. I don't want to die before I'm 50 or 55 years old. My youngest children are 11 and 14. It is not likely that I will see them grow up. Uh, and that truly bothers me. And my children are consciously aware of it too, so they also watch me in my failing health. And it is very difficult for them. Uh, and they do understand that mommy has bad days. And when mommy's in bed, that means it's a really bad day. So I want better days the way I felt when I was able to use cannabis. And I have used vapor, but I can tell you of those of you that are knowledgeable in dabbing, which is the purified oil, shatter, um, wax, whatever you'd like to call it, it is not dangerous. Uh, I wish that the FDA would actually conduct studies on this. Bingo. Yes, you have to be cautious about what solvent you use, 
but there are extremely knowledgeable people, including physicians and other medical professionals, that have made this process very effective and almost fail safe. So instead of when I use a vaporizer, which is my PAX, dabbing is instant. My pain is immediately alleviated. Uh, I, have a, I have a tremor, as you can see. It goes away immediately. My, I have muscle wasting disease. I have myasthenia gravis. Uh, my body does not make protein. I have no T cells or B cells because I lack an immune system. So my future, I already know, is going to be, I'm going to be hooked up with a hose pipe in one or the other of my arms as long as my veins are healthy. And that means as soon as they collapse, I'm going to have to have a port put in somewhere because I will no longer be able to receive my infusions intravenously. They are going to have to go through a port. And that is not something that I want to happen to me. So I can tell you that when I used cannabis, I was much better. I would really like to be better again. I want to get up every morning happy, not depressed. I'm tired of dealing with PTSD, which stems from four months in the RNICU, and then again another two months in the PICU when my daughter had turned 10 years old. So PTSD can come in many different forms to our veterans, to those that have experienced horrific events in their lives. Mine stems from hospitalizations, and as my boyfriend Scott can tell you, if I hear any particular alarm, whistle, ding, bing, it automatically starts setting me off. And there's nothing that I can do about that, but cannabis did control that. And I was no longer jumping out of my skin every time I heard an alarm bell that sounded like I was in the RNICU or PCIU again. So PTSD is very real and it needs to be shown for the face that it is. So I'm not only speaking for me, but I am speaking for our veterans who are continually killing themselves because they cannot cope. And the medications that are out there today do not cover broad spectrally what they need to survive and get through their trauma. And that is a travesty. So in closing, I do not see how cannabis is illegal when we all have an e-cannabinoid system in our body. Therefore, why is it illegal? And I'm also here because I am appealing to everyone here to help others like me who are terminally ill. And we do, we know we are dying. We are suffering needlessly. We are dying very slow, painful deaths. And my children have recently asked me, Mommy, does it hurt to die? And yes, it does. It does. And I'm aware of it every day. At any time, something can come along and happen to me. I can develop an infection. I have to stay out of the public eye. I have to basically remain a recluse in my house for fear that I may contact the flu. I've had pneumonia 11 times. So immunologically, according to my, inter my uh, immunologist, for the moment, I am stable. But now I have gone into the autoimmune progression of the disease, uh, also of which CVID patients are at a 75% greater chance of developing autoimmune as well. Those are located on chromosome number six as well. So, in closing, I would like to appeal to the masses that we need to join together and we need to put a new face on cannabis, and that is that we all have an e-cannabinoid system. And because of that, it is illogical for it to be illegal. And that if the need is there, it is our civil right to determine what we put into our body. 
and I will not use opiates. I refuse painkillers. I do have to take a very high dose of an antidepressant to control my PTSD, anxiety, and depression, which I would love to come off of. Uh, however, I cannot do so until I am able to have legal access to cannabis. And the risk that I take and that each and every one of us take being in an illegal state, we know the penalties. We can go to jail and end up being with the likes of those that are murderers, rapists, and other heinous crimes simply for using something to make us well and to heal and to treat. And that, frankly, is hypocritical. So our government across the board, across the United States, here in Alabama and in every state, need to realize that other countries have already recognized this and are passing decriminalization laws in order for their citizens to use what they need to treat their conditions. Why is the United States still reluctant to see the evidence precisely as it is? And it is, I agree with you, corporate greed. But I again say it is not the physician because the physicians are continually losing their practices because they are dictated to by your insurance companies. Uh, this, I hesitate to call it Obamacare, but the health care reform has uh, decimated practices and it is continuing to happen and I have five physicians who are out of practice now because of that. So that is a trend until things change that will continue. So thank you for having me here today. I really am happy to meet you. I hope that you will all stand with me and we can all be on one page and we can demonstrate to every congressman, every senator, Whoever our first, uh, our next president is, not going there, but whoever it is, well, we can appeal to their, co their compassion, hopefully their common sense, but definitely by education. And education is crucial if they are going to decide what we can and cannot put into our bodies, they better have a medical degree saying, why we can or cannot use it. So, thank you very much. It was a pleasure speaking with you today. I enjoyed meeting all of you. Thank you. So, good luck to you all. And please visit me under Maven for legalization because what I am doing is collecting stories of those who have used cannabis as medicine and I will keep your name anonymous if you so choose and only use a first name or a pseudonym. But I am standing here as the person that you saw on Facebook. I'm a regular person like you. I'm a mom of four. Uh, unfortunately, my physical limitations, I went from being wide open 150 miles an hour with my hair on fire to basically being able to do nothing. Cannabis allowed me to live the life that I once had, and now I'm in a downward spiral in my health since November, and it continues to spiral downward. So, blessings to all of you. I wish you the best, those of you who are in other states that have come here to help us today. I hope your initiative passes, but I believe we certainly need to begin promoting education to our elected officials so they can make an informed decision about why it should be legalized. So I bid you good day. I enjoyed meeting you. Thank you very much. And I wish you all the best. So let's keep fighting.